Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Schauf and coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us on our webinar Wednesday series. Today is December 19th, and we've got a full load of webinars every 30 minutes throughout the day. The speakers are industry experts, including uh, attorneys, accountants, and other industry professionals that are sharing their knowledge about federal contracting. All the webinars are complimentary, and they are recorded. You can find those either on our YouTube channel uh, or on our uh, website under the webinar section. We have some upcoming events in January. Uh, those can be found on our website under the event section. Uh, you can see here January 15th, a class on partnering and subcontracting, and then later in the month, January 29th, a class on GSA schedules. Uh, we do offer advertising options in our newsletter, which now reaches over 13,000 unique subscribers, uh, and we are now offering um, advertising in our 2019 webinar series. A little bit about us, we're based in downtown DC and provide professional services for federal contractors, including training, market analysis reports, GSA schedule assistance, and more. Full list of our services is on our website under the services section. And uh, as mentioned earlier, the events and seminars are listed under the events section. A little bit about me uh, is listed here on this slide. Uh, but let's dig into today's topic because I've got a ton of slides to, uh, to go through, so I'm going to try to move this pretty quickly. Um, so getting started in federal government contracting can be daunting, but it is a uh, pretty good size opportunity for most businesses as long as uh, you have the determination and um, perseverance to stick with it. It is a long sales cycle. So I've got quite a few steps to go through in, in 30 minutes, so I'm going to move this fast. We don't take questions, so if you do have questions about this or anything else, just uh, the very last slide will have contact information. So number one, you want to establish your business. Make sure that uh, you are a legal entity. Register your tax ID number and grab that there with the IRS. Second piece is getting your DUNS number. This is the Data Universal Link Numbering System. It's your nine-digit kind of business social security number. You can get that from Dun & Bradstreet. And the DMV number will come into play in some other components of federal government contracting. The government uses the DMV database to vet companies for financial stability and make sure that you've been in business, that you're not operating out of somebody's garage. Next thing, you'll go to SAM, uh, SAM.gov, System for Award Management. Um, and you will register here. This will, uh, will be where you plug in your information about your industry codes. Uh, and it's the best practice, I think, to update this twice per year, uh, making sure that you do have multiple contacts in there uh, in case somebody's out on leave or uh, somebody leaves the company. Uh, but keep in mind that your information here sometimes uh, will be uh, data mined by companies trying to sell you services, whether it's GSA schedule services from uh, random companies down in Florida or elsewhere in the country. Uh, you want to be wary of those. Um, just keep in mind that any um, anything that comes with a .gov uh, email address obviously is going to be official. If it's something that looks like government, double check the email address. Make sure it's not .biz, .co, .com, .info. Um, those people are probably the ones trying to sell you something, and that's they're going to grab the contact information from Sam most of the time. Uh, and Sam, you're also going to ensure that you are a small business or not. Um, uh, how do you know if you're a small business? Well, it depends on uh, what your primary NICS code is, your North American Industry Classification System, which identifies what it is your business sells. Uh, depending on that, it, sometimes it's based on revenue. Uh, other times it's based on employees. Sometimes it is based on both of those. If it's based on employees here, you can see um, some of the uh, industries that are affected by um, small business uh, being based on employee size. And then others here are based on uh, dollar size. Uh, next, you'll then get your CAGE code. That's the Commercial and Government Entity is what that stands for. It's a five-digit character. It's used by DOD primarily uh, for payment uh, and other identification purposes. Some organizations will, uh, will potentially ask you for that as well, just to ensure that you are a federal contractor. You also want to keep in mind there are a lot of resources that are out there to help you, many of which are paid by uh, or funded through government dollars. So you've got the PTAPs, which are the Procurement Technical Assistance Programs. Uh, sometimes they're called PTACs, Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. There's one in every state. Uh, in this area, we've got multiple uh, PTACs in Maryland. Um, they've got a couple different locations in Maryland, College Park, Columbia, Baltimore, Bel Air, uh, Bowie, a couple others. Virginia has them scattered throughout the state. D.C. has one. 
score. Um, these are mentors uh, that provide one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring, training, and classes for uh, commercial entities, but the score offices in this uh, local DC area are primarily focused on government contracting. You've got SBDC, Small Business Development Center, same thing, they're also gonna be providing uh, training and classes, and then you've got your local SBA offices, which are the true government entities. Plenty of incubators, particularly in this area, 1776, Eastern Foundry, um, and many others that are focused on, uh, on government. Should have a capability statement. What is a capability statement? It's your one page kind of company res resume. Um, you should have just a, a general one for your business that resides on your website, uh, but you also want to have tailored ones that are tailored towards a specific opportunity that you are then taking either to an agency or to a potential partner or a potential prime contractor that you're going to be subbing to. Uh, here's where you're going to highlight your past performance, preferably any federal performance. If not, second best, I think, would come in. Uh, as any prime contract uh, or subcontracting with a prime past performance. Third on the, the list there, I would say, would be state and local. Um, that would be relevant to the opportunity. Any contract vehicles that you've got, GSA schedules, um, uh, Seaport E, NASA Soup, any of the others you want to list there. If you have any set-aside designations, your women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, 8A, or anything else, uh, you probably want to plug that in. And then just the basics there, your Dunn's cage, NAICS, and your TIN number. Make it easy for the government to find you and understand what you do and what your capability statement is focused on. Number seven, you want to use the OSDABOOS. Who are the OSDABOOS? These are the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. They advocate, they're advocates for the small business community. Every, every agency has at least one of these. We've got a list of those there uh, on these links. And these slides will be available uh, probably by tomorrow or at the latest Friday. Industry days, every agency has an industry day. It's an open house for small businesses. Sometimes it is related to a particular opportunity. So if you see something on FedBizOps um, where the government is either doing perhaps a source of sought or they're looking for vendors who can potentially fulfill a need that they have, sometimes they will have an open house for that. Um, you can find teaming partners. You're gonna find other small businesses, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and all the rest. And this is where you will bring that tailored capability statement, not just a general one. Um, that is if the industry day is focused on a specific opportunity. If not, then you want to make sure that your capability statement is focused on what that agency's mission is. Go to their website, do the homework, look on Google News, get the alerts for that particular agency if that's where you think um, that you've got a, a play. Uh, those industry days will, uh, they are uh, there's no cost to attend, but uh, we'll, we'll say that they do sell out fast. You can put set up alerts on FedBizOps uh, for those. So FedBizOps, let's talk about that. Uh, it's going to be the website that is open to anybody and everybody. Uh, basically, it's kind of where you can go to hunt for opportunities that are over $25,000 and above. You can scale this down to look for opportunities either in your uh, NAICS code, your business size, or geographic location. Uh, and we would highly encourage you to look for the sources sought in RFIs, requests for information. Uh, everything else has been probably worked for about 12 to 24 months, and FedBizOps will be migrating to SAM soon, so you'll see some uh, information on that. Uh, but sources sought, that's going to be the beginning of an opportunity. The government's looking for sources. Sometimes it'll then graduate to request for information, and then from there, uh, it'll grow into an RFP. But that time frame is, uh, like I said, about 12 to 24 months. Sometimes a little bit shorter, sometimes even a little bit longer. So when you do see that RFP, there have been companies that have already submitted their sources sought and perhaps even had some face-to-face -face meetings with the potential um, person in charge who is overseeing that opportunity. You want to look at the acquisition forecast. The agencies are required to post what they are going to be purchasing. Uh, usually, in a um, usually is posted in a pretty nice spreadsheet. Not all the time. Uh, of the industry code, the dollar amount, the contracting officer, the phone number and email address of that contracting officer, and then the quarter that they are going to be purchasing that if there's a contract vehicle used, as well as who the incumbent is. So you want to make sure that you, you grab this information. We have it posted on our website. Uh, you can look at all the federal agencies and what they are um, purchasing for the next fiscal year. This should help you be a little bit more strategic and plan your resources, whether you're going to need proposal writers, business development people, and then post-award kind of the contract administration and other components. 
Uh, this is just a screenshot of some of the forecasts. So if you're showing the DLA, DOD, we've made it very easy on our website under the uh, resources section to get to the OSDBUs, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, as well as look at what those agencies are purchasing. Uh, this is just another screenshot. I think this is from uh, DOD, uh, from the Coast Guard. Uh, and so, like I said, some of these do come in. Um, I'm sorry, this is uh, DHS. And some of these will come in in nice uh, spreadsheets. Others will have something you can uh, click on to um, to convert that over. To that. The SBA scorecard, this is a great way to reverse engineer, especially if you are a small business. Uh, it's an annual scorecard. The agencies get a letter grade indicating if they've met their set-aside goals or not. Uh, the goals are 24% of federal contracts should go directly to these small businesses, and then 36%, which is a little bit higher than the 24, should go to the small businesses. And what does this mean? That the prime contractors, the large businesses, need to parse out 36% uh, or more of their uh, federal government business to the small businesses. Use this to propel your strategy. Uh, we've got a snapshot of the scorecard on our website. That link is listed there on the slide. The way it breaks down is 5% should be going to women, uh, another 5 to the uh, disadvantage. That's going to include the 8As, 3% um, for both HUBZone and SDVOs, the Service Disabled Veteran Owned. Here's kind of a, a look at um, an older uh, scorecard on how the agencies did, both prime as well as subcontracting. And agency by agency, we have those also listed on our website under the resources section. So maybe you pick an agency or two that has the propensity to award contracts to your particular set-aside. Let's say you're an 8A, then you pick the agency that's done really well with awarding contracts to the uh, disadvantaged businesses. Uh, but then maybe you pick another agency that needs to get their letter grade up. Uh, you also want to look at the top 100 vendors. Again, this is public information. We've got it on our website under the resources section top 100 vendors per agency. So if you find that one of these agencies has the propensity to award contracts to you, you probably want to know who's really in there doing the bulk of the work. Go to the FPDS website or go to our website and pull it up pretty quickly. This will then allow you to find potential partners. And you want to make sure you register on the, um, this is just a snapshot of what that looks like. Um, and uh, then you want to go to their website and register as a small business vendor. Make sure you have a specialized and tailored capability statement that you upload there, not just something general because you and everybody else are going to be knocking on their door. So you've got to bring some value to separate yourself from the others and um, and perhaps bring an opportunity to the table. Make yourself different from the other people that are just uh, kind of standing in line waiting for uh, these primes to hand something out. Do your homework. Speaking of doing homework, you can do this through data and research. So having a plan and, and being strategic, knowing when to bid, when not to bid, research your target agencies as well as uh, potential partners. Again, make sure that you've done some homework on FPDS to find out uh, what uh, what contracts these companies have. There was you know a list of those top 100 contractors. Do some homework to find out what contracts do they have that are coming up for renewal where you can perhaps add some value. Um, and participate with them. Uh, FPDS is just a simple um, screenshot of you could plug in the company name there, you can plug in NAICS codes, you can plug in agency names um, and do a ton of, uh, grab a lot of, of good data there. There's also a lot of data aggregators out there as well, people that uh, like Bloomberg Gov and um, EasyGovOps and GovTribe and uh, GovWin, uh, all that will aggregate data for you. You can buy subscriptions to their data. Uh, or you can do it yourself on some of these sites, usaspending.gov is another. Uh, a lot of it then also comes down to relationships. Uh, where you build relationships, you're going to attend events, networking um, networking events, conferences, uh, and that sort of thing. So government obviously is risk adverse. Um, so it's going to take them uh, 12 to 24 months to uh, build trust with you and um, and so you can go to these events and shake the right hands. Uh, NCMA uh, has a lot of good uh, luncheon series, FCA, uh, where you will actually have government people attending, sometimes speaking, and these are great opportunities. Contract vehicles come into play. How's the government uh, going to purchase from you? And a lot of times, if you are lucky enough to get that face-to-face, -face, that's going to be one of the first questions they ask. How do we get to you? Well, you need a contract vehicle. This could be a GSA schedule. 
to be Navy Seaport E, NASA Soup, or any of the others. Most agencies do have their own contract vehicle. Make sure you just don't get it just for the sake of getting it and then uh, kind of have the build in and they will come mentality. It doesn't always work out. Um, so be strategic and use the data to identify what contract vehicles your customer prefers. The certifications, um, we didn't put this as first and we certainly don't encourage you to um, make this the first thing that you lead with either in conversations or on your capability statement. It's certainly important, but um, it should just be the, the cherry on top. Um, so make sure you get those at the right time. Some of them are going to have expirations, including the 8A. Uh, we, we know a lot of companies that have been premature in getting it and wasted the first couple of years just trying to figure out government contracting uh, versus maybe doing the, uh, the converse of that, figuring out government contracting and then pulling the 8A trigger at the right time. Use that scorecard uh, to kind of reverse engineer and figure out where uh, you should deploy your efforts and time. The industry associations and organizations, I alluded to some of those before regarding their lunch uh, meetings and other events that they have that are open not just to members, but to also non-members. Uh, Chambers of Commerce, particularly in this area, Reston, Prince William, they always have a lot of good, um, as well as Arlington, um, always have a lot of great uh, events related to government contracting just because of the nature of where we're located. Stay informed. Know what's what's going on with your customer. What are their challenges? What are their obstacles? Where have they had success? Uh, what are things that you can help them with? So um, be aware of changes regarding the rules, the federal acquisition regulation. Um, and we've got some uh, links to various resources, including books, blogs, podcast journals, and, and other uh, publications that we think that you should be subscribing to. So take all this data and uh, and let that kind of guide the direction that you're going to go. It is a long sales cycle. Um, know when and where to use your time and resources and prioritize. It's okay not to bid on something. Um, there's going to be a cost of business all the time in any industry, but federal government sometimes can, uh, can get a little bit out of hand with uh, business development, proposal writers, and all the other components that go into it. Um, but you definitely want to lead with your capabilities, the past performance, and then most importantly there, build relationships. People and tools, uh, we talked about here some of the, um, the resources that come into play and the cost of doing business. Um, some of these on, uh, on either side we can certainly help you with, um, so feel free to, uh, to contact us if you want to discuss any of those. So some conclusions, there's obviously a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's no silver bullet, it's really just a matter of day in, day out, putting in the time, the effort, uh, attending the events, joining the associations, going to the conferences, responding to the RFPs, uh, going to the industry days, getting the certifications, getting the contract vehicles, and really just uh, building the right uh, strategic relationships. Um, we do have another webinar at one o'clock that's covering direct uh, versus direct contracting versus subcontracting, so feel free to join us for that. Uh, but it does make sense to continually refine your strategy uh, make sure that uh, you're staying on top of any changes to the FAR as well as uh, just general uh, contract vehicle changes. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, you know, it's not, you see a lot of successful companies, you wonder how do they do it. Um, it's, it's not overnight. There are some one-hit wonders that pop up from time to time, but generally speaking, you look at the successful companies, they're out there, they're at the breakfast events, they're um, networking, they're forming joint ventures, uh, mentor-protege uh, participants, they are speaking at conferences, they're on boards of uh, chambers and so forth. So uh, it takes all of that and then some. If you do have any questions, feel free to contact us at the number or phone number or the email address here, and we hope you'll join us later today for some of the other webinars. Thank you.